Uh, my paper represents my initial attempts to reread a villainized character through theories of self and motherhood in black studies. I will begin by providing some background information on the Supiant figure, and then I will explain the aforementioned theories before turning to a reading of the story. Ultimately, I suggest that Naila Hopkinson's text creates space for metaphorical resonances of the Supuyant that complicate her villainous meanings. The Supuyant is a vampiric figure from Caribbean folklore who is meant to inspire fear and horror. As Giselle Liza Anatole explains in her comprehensive study, for those raised in Afro-Caribbean cultures, the word Supuyant and its equivalents conjure images of frightening old age, alarmingly bloody, skinless creatures, terrifying invasions of the home, and nightmarish penetrations of the body. These images correspond to the Supuyant's most common form as an elderly woman who keeps to herself during the day and then emerges from her skin at night, becomes a ball of flame, and plagues her community by drinking people's blood. Traditionally, this figure works to instill a dread of woman's power and agency. She is also demonized for having such power and agency while being older, poor, and geographically and socially removed from community. There is a dual imposition of monstrosity here, the misogynoir that inscribes black women as dangerous and pathological, and the more general anxieties of transgressed borders. As Anatole points out, the stigma of female mobility is key here, a vilification of women moving away to carve out their own independent spaces, rather than remaining within patriarchal family and community structures. The Sukuyant is unbound by these expectations, moving freely beyond walls and her own skin to penetrate the walls and skins of others. Understandings of her as empowering are historically rare. There are, however, folklore versions that allow her to stand in for what Savannah Shange calls the vampiric thirst of empire, reframing her as a symbol of white colonial power. The traditional Sukiant is thus a monstrous figure to be dreaded and despised, whether that fear stems from misogyny or from the unjust legacies and realities of white supremacist violence. My reading of Nalo Hopkinson's short story, Greedy Choke Puppy, takes a generous approach to the otherwise vilified Sukiant character by placing her within a model of being singular plural. The story centers on Jackie and her granny, two black Caribbean Sukiant women. Jackie, who is in her 30s, is a graduate student at university. She wants to get married and start a family, but she feels that her age is making her less desirable to men, worrying that it may be too late for her to achieve her dreams. These worries lead her to obsess over maintaining a youthful appearance, an obsession that fuels her Sukuyant transformation and her consumption of the most youthful blood, that of babies. Her granny realizes what she is doing, however, and slashes Jackie's skin in half so that she cannot return to her human form in time for mourning. Jackie's final action is to fly as a fireball into the sun, and her granny weeps, heartbroken. To think with this Sukuyant character is to think with claiming a position that encompasses and reimagines monstrosity. Central to this claiming is Hortense Spillers' conceptualization of flesh in relation to the capacity to name. Indeed, her essay Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe begins with a list of names imposed on black women, a locus of confounded identities against which white supremacist patriarchy defines and upholds itself. These markings work on blackness to frame the female body and the male body as territory of cultural and political maneuver, not at all gender related, gender specific, meaning that we lose gender difference in the outcome. Yet Spillers makes a distinction between this body that I spoke of just now and flesh, eventually concluding that only the female stands in the flesh, both mother and mother dispossessed, a problematizing of gender that places her out of the traditional symbolics of female gender. These are the discourses that surround Spillers' theorization of black female flesh under slavery and its afterlives, discourses that sever meanings of femininity and maternity while also inscribing meanings of excess and fungibility. The oppressiveness of these inscriptions, these misnamings, makes it almost difficult for black women to assert their own names, as claiming the complexity of black female experiences constantly comes into friction with forms of misogynoir that pathologize every affective and embodied dimension of the black feminine. The assertion of self-naming thus requires an active process that Spillers describes as stripping down through layers of attenuated meanings, and there awaiting whatever marvels of my own inventiveness. 
There is a sense of going deeper into the self here, yet Spillers also offers the personal pronouns in the service of a collective function, positioning her invented self as significant to the communal. In the simultaneous refusal of external gazes and acceptance of collective belonging, the singular plural of self-naming and loving flesh emerges. My understanding of loving flesh is an adaptation of Fred Moten's thinking on Spillers' work that moves into the modality of being singular plural through Kevin Quashie's theorization of the term. Moten argues that the act of loving flesh is predicated on a condition of vulnerability, unprotectedness, and openness, a position of blackness that can only be taken communally. For him, there is a decidedly maternal dimension to this position, emphasized by Edward Glissant's idea of consenting not to be a single being, a sense of kinship that emerges through a giving over of the self so that it can be loved. This communal practice of vulnerability and love seems to be at odds with the soupillant consumption of children's lives. Yet I want to think about what it would mean to truly consent to being singular plural in the context of what Spillers terms claiming the monstrosity of a female with the potential to name, the monstrosity of naming the child when motherhood has been severed. Here I turn to the gendered specificity of Quashi's work, who also draws from Glissant's phrasing to conceptualize being singular plural as oneness, as a way of thinking of the one as relational. Rather than figuring self-naming in opposition to the communal, he argues that the first person is an essential component of black female relationality, and indeed a syntax of relational inhabitants. This black feminine entanglement of singular and plural being then undermines the binaries that can only understand Jackie as selfish, anti-communal, and anti-mothering, instead reading her focus on herself as simultaneously existing with the practice of loving flesh. In other words, her relations of consumption encompass both the singular desire of self-protection and the plural outcome of loving, naming, and claiming the child as part of herself. The story establishes the monstrosity of the soupion through Jackie's research, differentiated from the rest of the text by its bolded font. She reads that the soupion is usually an old, evil-tempered woman, a description that points to an inherent evil, as well as an affective aura of bitterness and hostility. This academic text further over-determines the soupiant as a monstrous being in the description of her methods of killing. She may visit one child's bedside a number of times, draining a little more life each time, as the frantic parents search for a cure and the child gets progressively weaker and finally dies. Or she may kill all at once. The first sentence is lengthened by dependent clauses, mirroring the slow process of the soupiant gradually draining life over time, while the parents search for a way to save their child, a search that fails with the intertwined finality of the death of the child and the end of the sentence. The second sentence is tenuously connected to the previous one by the conjunction or, and yet is separated from it both by the period and in terms of its length, which, like its content, is a much shorter and blunter experience, killing all at once. In this way, the inscriptions of monstrosity encompass both the descriptive and the grammatical to emphasize the horrors of the Soupion's murderous acts. At the same time, however, Jackie's research connects the Soupion to experiences of parenthood in ways that give her a community role. The title of Jackie's thesis, Magic in the Real, the Role of Folklore in Everyday Caribbean Life, draws attention to the significance that speculative stories and figures can have within a community a significance that provides nuance to the monstrosity of the Sucreon. In terms of her lore, the boldest scholarly text suggests that historically the figure serves to explain infant deaths that would have seemed mysterious. The Sucreon thus takes on the burden of the loss of a newborn child, creating sense out of a traumatic experience and providing a monstrous form that can easily be blamed for the pain. There's something strangely caring in this understanding of the figure, an apparent contradiction in which she can cause suffering and yet simultaneously function as a threat of coherence against the disruptive forces of trauma. Yet I suggest that she is not a contradiction, but rather an interruption of moral and social binaries that blends and moves their supposedly opposing parts into something new. In other words, the Sucreon's narrative function is intertwined with her murderous acts in ways that undermine the binary thinking and its oversimplifications an undermining that begins to transform the grammar of monstrosity that the bold text otherwise inscribes onto her. 
By claiming the monstrosity of feeding on an infant, Jackie reimagines the unprotected plural condition of loving flesh in coexistence with an assertion of the singular. Her desire for youth drives her choice of sustenance, arguing that when your youth start to leave you, you have to steal more from somebody who still have plenty. I fly out the window and start to search, search for a newborn baby. Her rationalization of a decidedly antisocial act is certainly horrifying, yet her use of first and second person pronouns complicates what might un otherwise be understood as purely villainous selfishness. The second person you draws the reader into her being, into a relation that continues through the first person I. In this sense, the I is not an anti-relational individual, but rather the black feminine relational one, bringing you with her while also taking singular responsibility for the actual act. This responsibility remains in the event of consumption. Hear the young breath heating up in the lungs, blowing out, wasting away. He ain't know how to use it. I go take it. The baby is completely unprotected here, vulnerable to the relational for forces he encounters. In this moment, Jackie takes ownership over the infant, insisting that she knows best in a monstrous inflection of mothering. Yet the infant is not devoid of agency, asserting his life force later in the story by crying from within Jackie during her nighttime flights. In this carrying of the child, Jackie simultaneously causes suffering and soothes it, a coexistence of her sucreant self and the embodiment of unprotected love flesh. Jackie and the baby are thus transformed by a speculative imagining of claiming the child, of what it would mean to become singular plural. But we must strip down the surface misnamings in order to find this oneness. We must consent to the relation extended by that use of the second person. Although Jackie's destruction might appear to be a punishment, her fiery form undermines this reading to gesture towards a more generous possibility. In Jackie's depiction of her initial transformation, she states that her hyper-awareness of the decrease in male attention creates a burning in me belly that spread out to my skin till I couldn't take it no more. Overcome by the heat, she rips off her nightdress and her skin comes off with it, revealing one big ball of fire underneath. And Lord, the night air feel nice and cool on the flame. The refreshing coolness of the night air is repeated when Jackie elaborates on the freedom of being fired. The skin only confining me. I could feel it getting old, binding me up inside it. Sometimes I does just feel to take it off and never put it back on again, we. Oh God, I does be so free like this. The night air cool and I flying so high. While she desperately wants to be valued for her desirability and reproductive capacity, her suppliant being refuses, however briefly, to be solely defined by a misogynistic male gaze, undermining sight to embrace the comforting sensation of the air around her constantly shifting flames. With this context in mind, Jackie's final action is not one of death, but rather of transformation. Oh God, morning coming already? Yes, I could feel it, the sun calling to the fire in me. I going, I going, where I could burn clean, burn bright. By joining with the sun, she expands her oneness to create a relationality between internal and external flames, a being singular plural that intertwines her self-naming and the consumed child with solar grounds. These solar grounds are the insurgent grounds of Jackie's black feminine being. Her fiery flesh is open to the welcoming heat of the sun, and the layers of imposed names are stripped down to allow her to burn brightly in a naming of herself as Sukuyant. Monstrosity is thus reimagined as transformative rather than punitive, something that can be claimed in a refusal of misogyny. Jackie is not simply a two-dimensional villain who eats babies, although it would be very easy to read her that way. She is a complex figure who asks us to think beyond the skin level of consumption and towards the metaphorical meanings of claiming mother and child as one in the midst of pathologization, towards the fire that burns bright into the sun. Thank you.